I'm bored, and not bored with my life. It's a chaotic mess. It's fine. But um, um, I'm actually bored with most of the advertising I see. David Ogilvy, who was one of the Mad Men characters, was modeled after David Ogilvy, great advertising guy. We're going to talk about him sometime in the three sessions that we have here. Um, Ogilvy at one time got so bored and frustrated with his world with advertising that he actually retired for two years as a farmer in an Amish country because he just didn't want to see any of it. Our people who should be better than most, it, most of it bored me. And so this is sort of an indictment. You guys are defaulting to where all the dumb, boring people in advertising default to. Here's our product or our service. So here's our thing. Let's explain what it is. Let's list its five features. It comes in blue. Um, uh, we'll do these three things for you. Let's describe its features. Then let's translate the features into benefits badly, then let's pose some kind of little argument about why we're better than the other people who appear to be doing the same thing. Which, by the way, the minute you're there, you're in trouble. You shouldn't have to be saying why we do the same thing better, because you should be doing something nobody else does. That, so you got a perception problem there. But here's why we do it better. And most of those statements are, I think it was Helen Gurley Brown, I've lost track now who said it, but it might have been Ann Landers, it might have been Dear Abby, but the advice was, if you can't be kind, at least be vague. So the, the, these statements are all very vague, you know. It, it, and then there's price, and the great deal we're giving you on price. That's kind of all of it. Now, the big advertisers in TV, they dress that up a little bit just with stupid distractions. The mystic guy trying to open the back of the car with telekinesis. I mean, they dress it up a little. But really, that's what everybody's doing. And that ain't great advertising. And if that's where you've wound up, hopefully, what we're going to go over here um, is going to re-stimulate you to be more imaginative and interesting advertisers. It may at the same time make you more interesting people, because generally, if you're advertising boring, you're probably boring too. That's, that's how you get boring advertising. So we were originally supposed to do, um, bingo, uh, 51. We ain't even going to get through 43. Uh, but we're really going to do uh, 43 um, significant, uh, interesting moments in advertising, and covering, we'll skip a few for time, but 37, give or take, schools of advertising, meaning a, a consistent approach that people use over and over and over again. Um, and you have a little reference list, by the way, that will help you a little in remembering uh, as we go along. So uh, we'll start. Um, I wrote this ad in 1885. I know, you don't have to read it. Um, I wrote this ad in 1885. Um, it should be focused a little bit better than that, but I'm not a focus guy. Um, but you. You, you can see that one, right? No. So, what we are starting with, I can do a little without you seeing anything. Only I need to see it. Uh, we're starting with what's called the Created Problem School of Advertising. <coughs> and the Created Problem School of Advertising is when there is no problem 
And we have, in, politic, in politics it's called, a solution in search of a problem. Right? And it happens a little bit in politics. Oh, this looks interesting. Um, um, it happens a little bit in politics, but it actually happens a lot in advertising. Because if all we did was solve real problems, our gross national product would be about two bucks a year. And we'd be at 92% unemployment. So if you go home and you walk around your house and you study all sorts of things. So everybody got a Keurig machine in your hotel room? Or is this just a wonderful benefit afforded me? You got them? Remember, I can't see but you, so you got, yes. Okay. Um, so the Keurig machine is a product that is really a solution in search of a problem. Before somebody told you that you needed to get just one cup of coffee at a time, everybody was perfectly content making a Mr. Coffee pot of coffee. And most people drink three, by the way, at a time, so the Mr. Coffee pot was actually about right. Now you got to make three cups with three Keurigs. And by the way, all of you people that sort your trash and have five different trash cans and all that stuff, may I point out to you, you have gone from throwing away one bag of coffee to throwing away 5,622 little plastic cups a year, which do, are not biodegradable, just so a thousand years from now, when climate change finally does kill everybody, it'll be because of your damn Keurig little machine things. And mine too, right? But so this product is a solution in search of a problem. There was no problem. Nobody knew there was a problem. It really is not a problem. Everybody would have done just fine if nobody had ever figured this thing out. And now kind of, I mean, even I've got one in my office and I'm as anti-tech as you can possibly be. So the created, the created Problem School of Advertising um, is a really important part of business because mostly the money is in solutions for which there was no problem until we created the solution. This dates, it largely took over advertising in the 1920s when Americans became willing to talk about their bodies and bodily functions. And prior to that, none of it was spoken about whatsoever. Now, we have come a long way since 1920. So in 1920s, people began to actually talk about body issues. And advertisers quickly realized they had a whole new category in which they could sell things because before you couldn't sell them because you couldn't talk about it. Now there was one predating of all this, and I'll get back to them, which really is right in your business, as you know, the Dr. Brinkley story. But really the 20s really became this exploration of previously unmentionable and largely unknown problems. And the great pioneer was Listerine. So Listerine was a hospital antiseptic. And it was sold, you know, like in 55-gallon drums to hospitals. Um, it was invented in the early 1900s by a guy named Lambert in St. Louis. And it was at one time then marketed, you could buy it in drugstores, as a remedy for throat infections. So it was sort of like an industrial length, strength uh, antibiotic liquid if you had an infected throat. It was not a profitable product. Uh, the company barely, I don't know if I have numbers. Uh, I don't. But so in 1922, when this explosion of public conversation about bodily functions occurred in America. And you always want to look for a sea shift in public opinion and behavior and conversation because it opens up doors to sell things in a way you couldn't 
sell them before. So Rick's business, if it's still your erectile dysfunction clinics, it, 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 that, it, that is a sea change maybe. Oh, there we go. Well, there we go. Isn't that wonderful? So, bad breath. There was a medical term for it. Well, we had it for a moment. Now we're losing it. Is it there? Oh, good. Okay. So we're back to when I was drinking. You can see it. I can't. That's all right. I got it right here. I got it right here. We'll be okay. Um, it's Dean Martin. Um, so in 1920, 22, a couple of ad guys, uh, unnamed in the story, but figured out they could sell Listerine, not as a cure for throat infections, but as a cure for bad breath which nobody knew they had. So I don't know how everybody was walking around and not knocking each other down and all that shit before, but, I mean, cavemen had sex, and they undoubtedly had horrible body odor so, and bad breath. So presumably, this really was not a problem. You know, everybody was just turning their head and going at it, I guess. I, but, uh, but, but all of a sudden, these guys figured out we can sell bad breath and thereby sell Listerine. And here's the impact. It's really interesting. This, this company was like limping, doing nothing. The ad spend in one year went from virtually nothing, because you couldn't advertise the stuff because you couldn't, right, to five million a year. This is in 1922. Five million dollar a year ad budget. They were in 80 magazines with full-page ads, 300 newspapers across the country every week with full-page ads. The product that year produced a net profit of $4 million, and again, this is in 1922. Athlete's foot. You guys all know about athlete's foot, right? Some of you like to have it because it makes you an athlete. Athlete's foot was invented by an advertising copywriter. That's who invented it. Nobody before that knew they had it. Nobody was doing anything about it. And the first treatment product for it that was sold as an athlete's foot remedy already existed, just like Listerine had existed in a former life. It was a pain liniment called Absorbine Junior. If you don't have it, grandma has it in her medicine cabinet. We use it on racehorses. It's still sold as a pain liniment, but it became the cure with a different label on it for athlete's foot and created an entire industry. The aforementioned body odor. Nobody knew they had an objectionable, I mean, everybody, I guess, knew they had body odor, because, but nobody knew Body odor was invented by the John Powers Advertising Agency for a product called Mum Deodorant, which I don't think exists. But then it was picked up by another ad agency in 1928 for Lifebuoy Soap, which does, of course, exist. So here's some great Listerine ads. And I want you to go back to my early remarks and think about the difference between what you're going to see and let's show everybody the product, tell everybody what it does. Okay, so this is from, when is this from? 1928. Halitosis makes you unpopular. It is inexcusable and can be instantly remedied. There's an important copy. Don't fool yourself that you never have halitosis, as do many self-assured people who constantly offend this way. There's a demo. This copy over here. If you have any doubt of Listerine's powerful deodorant properties, make this test. Rub a slice of onion on your hand, then apply Listerine. Immediately, every trace of onion is gone. Even the strong odor of fish yields to it. Here's less subtle. 
the headline is, often a bridesmaid, but never a bride. <laughs> right? This entire ad is the story of Edna, unable to get a man because of her god-awful breath, <laughs> which Listerine will cure. They were equal opportunists. This is a picture of a lovely young woman, and the headline says, could I be happy with him in spite of that? And it is a whole story about her suitor, who is perfect in every way, except for the onion breath that would stop a truck. And she is trying to figure out how, if she can live with this guy. Back to her, we have she never really knew why. So this is a story about first dates. This is a story about this lovely young woman who goes on a date with a person she considers perfect, but he does not call or invite her, and she never knew why. Today, of course, you get a tweet, says your breath sucks, but, you know. <laughs> then, that just was not done, so Listerine was a cure for social dysfunction. It was a solution for all of what ails us in getting people to like us and interact with us. And it was made possible by us being willing to talk about things we, up until that point in time, were not willing to talk about. Now this has happened in a lot of industries. Cosmetic sur surgery is one of them. Women used to sneak off, hide that, not want anybody to know they got it done. Now they have parties and celebrate the new thing after they get it. Um, actresses talk about it openly. Hollywood actresses used to be smuggled to some doctor in, you know, who signed 56 non-disclosure oaths. Like you wouldn't know, right? But, <laughs> but this was never, now it's, you know, popular conversation. So the guy who revolutionized 20th century direct response did it in this school of advertising of a problem you never knew you had. It's where he cut his teeth. He's a very famous guy. His name is Max Sackheim. And Mac in, Max invented the Book of the Month Club, which sounds like a pretty benign product. I mean, it's not like Listerine, you would think. He was the inventor of the negative option uh, club plan, which we'll talk about a little bit. He also, for a separate product, he wrote one of the most successful direct response ads in all of history in terms of its longevity. It ran every week somewhere for 40 years. Its headline was, Do You Make These Mistakes in English? Uh, Max also popularized the American Express card. But let's go back to the Book of the Month Club. So if you're not very imaginative as an advertiser, and you are going to sell Book of the Month Club, which means you get a book sent to you every month. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to talk about the books. And you're going to talk about how they're picked. And you're going to talk about how you get them at half price. And et cetera, et cetera. That's what you're going to do. Not Max. Max's great line was, how frequently do you fail to get and read an important book which everybody else is discussing and reading. You inadequate, bad breath, athlete's foot riddled, dolt. Well, that's implied. So these ads, here's a typical Book of the Month Club ad. The headline is placed in your hand so that you can't miss it this outstanding book each month. I'll read you. Look, I got a squint too. Not only are you absolutely safeguarded against missing the books you want to read, you also keep completely informed about all the worthwhile new books, and you exercise a more discriminating choice among the new books than you do now. The average person, it's important. Sackheim is a great cap copywriter. The average person, this is how the ad starts. Very first sentence right here says, the average person. 
How do most people respond to that internally? Not me. I'm not average. Lake will be gone. All of the kids are above average. Pull up in a parking lot of any private school. Everybody's got a bumper sticker. My kid's a, you know, super A-plus student. There are no average students at this school. The reaction is instantly, not me. The ad then goes on to tell us how not to be one, because by your behavior, we know ye. So this ad turned a mundane product, like Book of the Month, into a solution like Viagra, like Listerine. That is real advertising. That is, forget the product, let's talk about the emotional issue of the product. Second school of advertising is, I call it the elephant in the room, it's the problem about which we do not speak. So this started to change too. There are still, this happens on an evolutionary basis. So there's stuff right now about which we do not speak. Here's one from 1923. And it might be a problem a lot of people wouldn't still speak about today. So this is a very successful ad for a product called Dr. Elliot's Five Foot Shelf of Books. So you got a five foot shelf of books. The headline is, one year married and all talked out. I'll read you one paragraph. Uh, if you are with your spouse and you are chuckling, not smart. Um, uh, some restraint is advised. He sits in moody silence under the lamp. The click of her needles, I assume knitting needles, today I'm uh, the the, the click of her needles is the only sound that breaks the veil of depression in the room. The veil of depression. See, that's copy. That's copy. Not five-foot shelf of books, they're leather-bound, they each have over 100 pages. They're the veil of depression. This changes everything. This, by the way, is what I call a mind hijack. Because it actually takes the mind totally away from the product. It doesn't matter, really, that it's a five-foot shelf of books. It's irrelevant. Right? It makes it irrelevant. And it switches the mind to that horrible experience living in the veil of depression and silence, and we must fix this. It flips a switch now in the way a person responds going forward. So let's talk about this mind hijack that is accomplished with one year married and all talked out. It links to pre-existing conditions or a false belief about pre-existing condition. So looping all the way back to Dr. Brinkley. So Dr. Brinkley, for those of you that don't know, there's a book I co-authored uh, with a member of ours uh, called Making Them Believe about his marketing. He was turn of the century, 1900s. And he marketed the first erectile dysfunction cure in America. This is way before Mike Ditka throwing the football through the football, through the tire, for, for Viagra. His cure for erectile dysfunction, for those of you that don't know, was grafting goat glands to men's testicles. So guys came by horse, by train, by every mechanism to the Brinkley Clinic to have him stitch goat glands onto their testicles. It might occur to you that can't have any effect. You might, you might as well graft a Buick. I mean, <laughs> what, 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 how can this possibly, 
However, uh, he became the richest doctor at the time, by the way, you didn't like have to go to medical school. Um, uh, he became the richest doctor in America. The American Medical Association was actually created to put him out of business. Um, uh, he was world famous um, and stayed famous for a long time. In the LBJ tapes that were released under Freedom of Information Act, um, there's a phone conversation Lyndon Johnson is having with somebody and he says, maybe I should go see Dr. Brinkley and get some of them goat glands. So the reason this improbable cure was sold so successfully is because of the mind hijacked the switch of pre-existing condition. We were an agricultural country at that time. Almost everybody lived on a farm or lived in town surrounded by farms. Everybody had goats and everybody knew goats were extremely horny, hence the term horny goat. Hence, if you go to a health food store today to buy a non-medical cure for this particular problem, you can buy a product called horny goat weed in pill form. So the minute we do this, one year married and all talked out and the veil of silence, guess what? That's a real pre-existing condition. Guy goes, I got it. What's the cure? So this is a real important Thing to understand about advertising is what do people already know? What do people already talk about privately that we can hook to? Next one, I just did this more because it's kind of fun than anything else, but there's a school of advertising called, let's not mention what this is really for. We'll sell it, but we won't really come out and say what people are going to use it for because we still can't quite do that. So this is an ad that ran in comic books uh, for a number of years, very successful, sold a lot of merchandise, and it is for the Raquel Welch pillow. For those of you who don't know who Raquel Welch is, that's why you got Wikipedia. So this is the Raquel Welch pillow which is sold with euphemism language, but close. It's a soft, huggable, kissable pillow. They left out a more overt <laughs> word. It's important that it is, uh, it's not the perfect date but it's still fun to hang out with. And it's very durable. <laughs> this is in comic books for teenage boys. Uh, by the way, um, everybody now is naming their vice presidential candidate. I'm running with Raquel Welch, if that's my choice. Um, um, so, why was I fired? This is a very successful control ad um, from 1926. It's a very sad looking guy with his hands in his pockets and sort of a frustrated wife looking at him. And the headline of the ad is, why was I fired? I'll read you the important points. She says, and this is the second job you've lost, dear, said his wife sorrowfully. We're surely up against hard luck. What is this ad really about? You ain't getting any until you get a job. That's what this ad is really about. You better like the couch, doofus. And three strikes and your ass is out. That's what this ad is about. All right. So we can't really say what this really is for, this free booklet that is going to fix this, but every guy got the message. I know what this is for, and I better send for it. Which gets us to one of my favorite categories, which is the anything but subtle category. 
So this is where we abandon all um, euphemism, all implication, all kindness, and we go for the throat. In the insurance industry, there's been versions of this for years. This one happens to be from 1926. From Prudential, um, big full page ad, big picture. Uh, you won't be able to read the sign here on the gate says Orphan Asylum. And there's these urchins here being dropped off at the gate of the orphanage and the kid says, they said father didn't keep his life insurance paid up. That's anything but subtle. Look at Prudential's ads today. This ad had balls. <laughs> Prudential's ads today are like castrated. If you tried to get that through their compliance department today, if any of you are in financial services, you know what a compliance department is, right? It's the sales prevention department on steroids. It's people who get together every day to figure out how an agent can't possibly sell a policy. That's what it is, right? It's like, it's kind of like two of those commandments God came up with. These guys are in a room figuring out every day how to frustrate the agent like there's no tomorrow. It's some kind of perverse exercise. You couldn't run this ad for Prue today for love nor money. But it would work. It would work. Here, think you can't pull this off for a mundane product? 1923. Let me show you the top first. There's two people outside a house, and the headline says, Jones must be broke. This is for DeVoe Paint. That's the advertiser, a company selling house paint. Can you be more mundane? How would most people sell house paint? Look at how they sell house paint today. We got paint. It's in 56 colors. It, it, you, your kid can write on it and we can write. No, 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 no. Jones must be broke. Okay. No matter how beautiful your home may be within, no matter how successful you may be, an outside surface of dilapidated paint is sure to give an unfavorable impression of your circumstances. Confidence, consideration, and respect surround the family whose home bears the beaming look of prosperity that only proper use of paint and varnish can provide. That's advertising. That's very different from a lot of what we see today. Next school of advertising. Buy now before it's really too late. The world is about to end. Spend your last dollar on this. This school lives on uninterrupted, ironically, forever. So here's a control ad from roughly 20 years ago. And you tell me we couldn't run this today. It's for the Wall Street Underground Newsletter. It's not particularly subtle. Read this or go broke. You're being fattened up for the kill. The rallies we've seen since the April tech wreck. I don't know what tech was 20 years ago. What, what were the tech stocks 20 years ago? Uh huh. I don't know. Um, we've seen since the April tech wreck, our classic bull traps, they're designed to lure naive investors back into the stock market. Facebook yesterday. Make no, so I can rewrite this. The April tech wreck, our classic bull traps, something like Facebook's huge leap yesterday, it was designed to lure naive investors back into the stock market, make no mistake. Wall Street insiders are preparing <coughs> another massive tech sell-off later this year when they'll siphon an additional $1 trillion out of ordinary investors, mutual funds, brokerage accounts, and retirement funds. Understand, this is for a newsletter. Now, this industry still gets it. 
If you go find their marketing and advertising in their direct mail today, it's still going to look more like this than it's going to look like dull, boring advertising. But it hadn't changed. We can still run it. We can take this and change a couple things. So I have a client, Craig Proctor. He's, he has the single biggest coaching program for real estate agents. And, our, and I've been working with him for 30 years. Our most successful ad ever had this headline. FISBO stands for for sale by owner, for those of you who don't know. Call a FISBO, go to jail. I wrote that and we ran it right after the do not call list law. Now you really, unlikely you would go to jail. I don't really care about facts. Um, they're not a big thing in my life. Um, so it's euphemistic. Uh, but you could lose your real estate license. Um, um, you could lose your ability to be a, a, a real estate agent, and you could pay big fines if somebody's on a do not call list. And at the time, his main competitor, pretty much all he taught as a coach was call FISBOs. Dial, 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 dial. So we ran this ad, call a FISBO, go to jail. Never beat it before. We've never beat it since. Now, it doesn't work, by the way, right now, because people kind of became immune to the problem. It still exists. But So the end of life as we know it, Another version of it is the put the fear of God in you school of advertising. And the thing you should know is that surveys consistently show people are less afraid of even death, debilitating illness, almost anything they are more afraid of being embarrassed. This tells you how foolish people are, but nonetheless, it's where they are. It's why people use the language of, right, I felt like I would die. I was embarrassed to death. Imagine, how could you be embarrassed to death. This mess was pretty embarrassing. Fortunately, I don't really care. Uh, and, and, but I certainly am not going to lose any sleep. Embarrassed to death. So Max Sackheim wrote this ad in 1918. And it ran every week for 40 years. Think about that. No changes. Those of you who are every day redoing everything to pacify Facebook and Google, think about that. 40 years. Wrote it once. Never changed it. Its appeal is this. Do you make these mistakes in English? Headline that worked for 40 years. Because everybody immediately, I don't know. And I don't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. Nobody does. Now, you should note, he wrote this in 1918. In 1926, when he wrote the Book of the Month Club advertising, he went right back to the same well. Will you be embarrassed in front of people because you haven't read the latest book? Next great school of advertising involves sex. Double entendre began in the 17th century. It means a phrase open to two interpretations, one of which is indecent. Now, you've got to understand the standards of what's indecent have changed a lot um, since this ad ran in uh, shoot, I don't have it here, but it ran in the early to mid-60s. So this is a JFK administration era ad. 
It's the most successful ad this company has ever run. They're still in business today. It's a famous ad. And it has a double entendre, and the second part of the meaning is indecent for its time. So at the time, the only people who colored their hair, first of all, were women. Secondly, they were either actresses or prostitutes. That's who colored their hair. No respectable woman would color her hair. And so Clairol ran this ad. It's got what is colloquially called today a MILF. Um, if you're offended by that, you know what it means. You, <laughs> therefore, you're not allowed to be offended. See, if you get the joke, you're not, you can't be offended by the joke, ever, ever. Or people tell me, you know, when Joan was at the super conference, when Joan Rivers was at the super conference, where they said, when Joan was alive, people would say, I found that whole thing you just did about handicapped people, really. If you get the joke, you can't be offended by the joke. You know too much. Anyway, so here she is. And she's got her little daughter peeking out from behind her. And the headline is, does she or doesn't she? The ad is actually about, does she color her hair? And only her hairdresser knows for sure. But the double entendre, of course, is something else entirely. It was the talk of the time. Late night jokes about it. There's a whole joke book of does she or doesn't she jokes. We're going to skip a couple for the sake of time and we'll leap to something that is somewhat apropos. The school of curiosity, school of advertising. Curiosity really does kill the cat. If you arouse people's curiosity, they then have to pay attention to your advertising. If they sort of already know the answer, they may not pay attention to the advertising. There's a guy by the name of Bud Weckeser. How many of you know Bud? You have to yell, because I can't see you. Anybody? Nobody. Wow. Those who don't study the history of what they do, and whether you know it or not, you are in the advertising business. Um, if you're new here and you arrived and you think you're in the plumbing business um, or the proctology business, same, or uh, what, whatever business you wanted, you're not. You're in the advertising and marketing business and your deliverable happens to be plumbing of one kind or another. So Bud ran a bunch of these ads. He's famous, by the way. And so if you don't study the history of what you do, you're not doomed to repeat it. You fail to repeat it when it would work for you. That's why you should know some of these people. So Bud Weckheser ran these great ads in the 70s, 1970s, mostly for home-based business opportunities, but sometimes for other things. And they all had this in common. They all had a photograph of somebody doing something that you couldn't quite figure out what the hell they were doing, like her. Okay. So they had some photograph of a person standing on their head or with a bucket over their head. She's twisting the lid of a jar with a black cloth over top of it, and there's a screwdriver laying here. And who knows, right? And the headline is a pure curiosity headline. Can you tell what this woman is doing? No, you can't. So you are immediately curious. Well, what the hell is she doing? Just like, you know? So it turns out what she's doing is making a bunch of money at home on a weekend, and there's a story. And so that's the school of curiosity. You don't see nearly enough of this. You, you hardly see this used. People are afraid of it. Now, you go through a magazine, this ad will leap out. So some more obvious stuff. We have the school of 
preposterous proposition. <coughs> I like this a lot uh, because it's very Barnum-esque. When you do this kind of advertising, here's what you do. You set up a proposition that is extremely appealing that nobody is going to believe. And then you go to work to make them believe it. They want to, but they know. They know. So anybody like over the age of 19 who listens to Bernie and thinks any of that makes sense, he's using this. I don't know if he knows he's using this. He may be nuts. Hard to tell. But if he's not nuts, he's using this. Deficit schmeficit. Imagine this. He's Jewish. If you're Jewish, or you have a friend who's a Jew, none of them are walking around going, deficit schmeficit, let's triple the deficit. I had a client for a number of years, Len Scheich, and he owned U.S. Gold, Go by the inch if you know the company. Len, Len's big deal, his big, we had a guy, we sold a license for his thing in Japan for a lot of money, mid seven figures. And the five Japanese guys came over to bring the money and bow and meet and tour the factory and all that. Len takes them to lunch. They've just brought, I swear to God, they have just brought seven figures, and they have come here from Japan to hand it over in person, because that's the culturally correct thing to do. He takes them to lunch at Furs Cafeteria with coupons. I said, honest to God. So Bernie's running around, oh, who cares? We'll triple the deficit. We'll give everybody everything for free. And this guy's Jewish. So he either is nuts, nuts, nuts. And he's going to be disowned by every one of his tribe. But he's doing preposterous school of advertising. This is fun. This makes advertising fun. You set up a preposterous proposition that no one would ever believe. Intuitively, instinctively, instantly, they know it's BS. And then you go to work to make them believe it. So in the 70s, we still had an idea in America, a consensus idea, that you worked at it. So this was a controversial ad in its time. There were newspapers that refused to run it because of this headline. It's a famous ad. It's written by a guy by the name of Joe Carbo. The headline is, The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. There were newspapers that refused to run it because intuitively everybody knew then no, there can't be any such thing. Today, we can run it. By the way, it should look familiar to you. It's my friend Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. It's the same thing, you understand. 1970s, I wrote and ran an ad at the same time. And we had magazines refuse to run this because it suggests that anybody and everybody can be a millionaire. Well, it was preposterous at the time. In weight loss, this is the norm. This is a great control ad for a weight loss product, take this capsule. It neutralizes all the calories in the food you eat. Eat any damn thing you want. All weight loss advertising is about that proposition, by the way. Eat any damn thing you want. So this is from 1970-something in the 1990s. And very recently, you've seen it. There was a powder. You sprinkle it on the food before you eat it, and you can eat anything you want. 
and the fat grams and the carbs and the calories, this powder, they don't stick then to you and they just shoot right through out the other end and you can eat anything you want. Everybody knows. But then, look at all the copy that went to work to make you believe this preposterous proposition. That's fun. See, that, that's the kind of advertising you want to do if you want to have some fun. Next school of advertising is, we will prove it. This is a preposterous proposition couched in the proof itself. So this is a control ad from classic, everybody in the advertising business knows it. It's from 1927. It ran for almost 15 years. It made a weird little guy really rich. If I can't grow hair for you in 30 days, you get this check. The whole thing is the guarantee. That's the whole argument. I'll pay you. I'll write you a check. If I can't grow hair, on your bald little pate in 30 days. Can you run that ad today? Yeah, sure. If you're willing to write the checks, you can run that ad today. And by the way, you'd be safer today because people are lazier. So the likelihood of you having to write very many checks, bald as they may be at the end of 30 days, is not very high. You could run that ad today. Now, you won't see Rogaine running it because they got a bunch of boring, ballless people doing their advertising. I have a client who should be running it. I can't get him to run it. They actually have a product that works. Oh, we can't do that. OK. Gets us to another important school of advertising, the irresistibly good offer. So what do most offers look like? Pick up any magazine you want, pick up a newspaper, go online. Most offers are if you can do that recognition thing in 15 minutes in the back, I can give it back to you. Um, so we can do it from 10 to 10.15, I can give it back to you. It's up to you. Um, but somebody might want to let me know. So the most offers are the, are the end of a boring advertising pitch. Therefore, the offer itself tends to be kind of boring. And it is usually stated as, here's a summary of the thing we just described to you, and you can get it, and you can save some money on it. Irresistibly good offer. So most offers are really bland. And even great price offers often fail just because they're not interesting. So as I predicted, Joseph A. Bank is broke fundamentally after going from two for one to three for one to five to one, I think, buy one suit, get four free. And on top of everything else, it has an increased gross sales. Because in and of itself, it still is not exciting. It's not irresistible. So when you set out to entice people to respond to you, a very big issue is this, is how irresistible is the offer? Now, a lot of old advertising is really worth paying attention to because they had much higher hurdles to overcome. So you can buy something real easy now. That was not the case 
in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, even into the 1970s. Joe Sugarman, who many of you know, or know of, and if you don't, you should. <laughs> Joe, I forget the year. Does anybody know the year? Ron, do you know the year? 800 number for the first time? Anybody? My mind now is, I think 70s. I believe 1970s was the first time anybody put a toll-free 800 number in, a, in an ad and could take a credit card over the phone. The credit card companies wouldn't let you do it. I believe Joe 100% reserved the charges in order to do it. So you, you know, it was hard to buy stuff. So people had a lot of time to not buy because they had to write out a check and they had to put it in an envelope. All these ads I've shown you had coupons in them. They had to cut the coupon out, write out a check, put it in an envelope, and tomorrow mail it. If they had a stamp at home, they could stick it out in the mailbox and put the little red flag up and the mail guy would take it. If they didn't have a stamp, they had to go buy a stamp in order to send the order. Think about this. We just convinced this guy, if we're not going to grow hair on his head, we're going to give him money at the end of 30 days, and then we're going to give him 24, 48 hours to think about whether he really wants to send that coupon in. Remarkable, anybody sold anything. Right? And think how much easier it is today. Click. So what they had to do, applied today, works even better. Hence the irresistibly good offer. So our friend Max Sackheim, who I talked to you about earlier, in 1925, when Max created the Book of the Month Club and made it one of the most successful businesses of its kind ever, he did it by combining four key elements. The first was very irresistible. Send no money now. Pay us later. Just get started. You're going to love it. By the way, all through the 1970s, you saw a lot of ads where you sent a check, but we won't cash it for 30 days. That's how we did 30-day money-back guarantees. You send us your check, but we won't cash it for 30 days. We'll keep it in a drawer, and we won't put de deposit it until the 31st day, so if you're not happy. But Max just did send no money now. We'll start you on getting books and we'll bill you. Subscription, exceptional value, and negative option. So they sold 40 million reprints of classic books in 1920 with a send no money offer. This is another Sakai ad for Book of the Month. You get only the books you want and pay only for those you keep. This is negative option. Millions of books were sold this way until the FTC got aggravated about it. There was a generation of of the month clubs that followed book of the month club. There was cheese of the month, wine of the month. They still, they're still exist, but most of them don't use negative option anymore. There's pajamas of the month. There's all sorts of things of the month, including utterly unmentionables of the month on this model. But negative option works where we send you the book and if you don't want it, you send it back. Or they would send you a notice of the book they were going to send you and you could opt out. But if you didn't, that baby was coming with a bill. And it was all irresistible offer driven. This is all the way into eh, the 1980s, I think. All these ads look kind of the same. Most of you are old enough to have seen them for books, for eight-track tapes, for cassettes. Um, they were all pretty much this idea. You got started, you choose, in this case, this is a lit literary guild, I think. It's four for a buck. You choose any four books for a dollar when you start, and then you're in the club, and you're being negative optioned for evermore. Reader's Digest was very big in this business. And it was all, so I don't really want to be in a book club. I don't really want to get a book every month. But Jesus, four hardbound books for a buck? How are you going to pass that up? 
And then look at all these books. Oh, well, there's a book I like. Now, there's a book I like. A buck. A lot of people, I'm sure, said, I'll do this and then I'll drop out. Right? You're nodding. Right? You thought that? How many books did you get? More than I wanted. Yep. Yep. I was taping, I was doing an infomercial for um, a product called Acne Statin, which was around before Proactive, if you know Proactive. Acne Statin was sold by infomercials in the 1960s, well, right, no, 1970s, right after Reagan deregulated the airwaves, and we could buy half hours. And so we're taping testimonials for three days for Acne Statin. And we found a great story, three generations all using Acne Statin, grandma, mama, and daughter, right? They were from some Appalachia country, town in, I don't know, Tennessee or West Virginia or whatever. So we fly them into L.A. And grandma, so acne statin is continuity, right? You're getting a shipment every month, and your credit card's getting dinged until you squeal stop, just like you wound up with a bunch of books you never read. And even with the intention of, I'm just going to take the four books for a buck, and I'm... So grandma is like 110. And she is shrunken to the size, you know, of a little hobbit. But her skin hasn't. So she's, I mean, she's like a Sharpe dog, this woman. How are we going to put this woman on camera? She look, Ron White's joke about his dog, right, is he, he lifts up the folds of the, and puts M&Ms in there, and then when the dog wakes up, he has a great day, right? Well, you could have done that with this woman, right? I mean, she just is... And here's the story she tells. I don't really need it anymore. I haven't used it in years. But my daughter's on it, and she gets her own, and my granddaughter's on it, and she gets her own, and it just keeps coming every month. I give it away. I have a big pile of it in my basement. I have a whole section of my basement where I have acne statin stacked up is all I could do not to say, hon, you can cancel. But they're like my client, you know, and 39 bucks a month is 39 bucks a month. I mean, this is what happens, right? People don't cancel. That was the magic of these offers. So an irresistible offer is what you're doing really just irresistible. You can't turn it down. One of the most famous of all. By the way, this and a number of the things I'm showing you uh, are in the Lifetime of Work Archives collection thing. Certainly any of my examples, which you'll see more of those in the second segment, are in there. So if you have that product, you can go back and find them. This is on page 294 in volume one. This is the famous Bob Stupak Vegas World ad. Any of you ever stay in Vegas World before it became the stratosphere? Yell, I can't see. Nobody. Boy, you missed. So Vegas World, the next time you go to Vegas, stratosphere is still there. It's, quote, quote, the last one on the strip. Bob redefined strip. City of Vegas sued him. He won in court the right to say he was on the strip. It's on Las Vegas Boulevard. It's just nearly downtown in the ghetto. It was a one-story slot machine place. You've seen them. They're wedged in. They're dying out, but they're wedged in between the big casinos. I think there's still an Irish one in Vegas wedged in between two of the big mega resorts. It's only one story. It's only got slot machines in it. You walk in, and it smells of beer and sweat and despair. And um, so Bob bought one of these. And, uh, and he turned it into Vegas World, giant high rise. Um, and it became the Stratosphere, which now has three towers and a gorilla shaped roller coaster. And I don't know. This ad rain worked everywhere. This is the ad person's copywriter's wet dream. Lazy Man's Way to Riches was the same way, by the way. Carbo used to go to his secretary on the first of every month, say, I want to spend X, name a figure, go buy ads. 
and let her put it anywhere she wanted to. Lazy Man's Way to Riches worked in Playboy. It worked in Good Housekeeping. It worked in newspaper. It worked in the Wall Street Journal. They only ran it once, then they refused to run it, but it worked. This ad, too, worked everywhere. And any place he could get a decent rate, he ran it. So Goldfish Monthly, this thing probably ran in there once or twice. It ran a lot in Parade, which is a magazine inserted in city newspapers all across the country, still exists. It ran in TV Guide, but you need a magnifying glass, because TV Guide used to be digest size, like Reader's Digest. And I mean, that ad shrunk down to that page is something. But for the right offer, people will go get a damn magnifying glass. So don't let anybody tell you you can't use 8-point type if you got to. If they won't go get a magnifying glass and read it, your problem really is not the eight-point type. Your problem is you didn't arouse enough interest with the big type they could read to send them in search of the magnifying glass. That's the whole problem. So Bob ran this ad everywhere. It was an irresistible offer ad. And the deal was, I want to get it exactly right, changed a little bit off and on, but for 396 bucks, 198 a person, you got your hotel room, a deluxe suite in Vegas World, which by the way, so Vegas World was always under construction because Bob had this one story place, he ran these ads, you paid in advance for this package I'm about to describe to you, and that's the money he used to build it with, no doubt. So as soon as he had enough money, he built another floor. So this place is always under construction. And it wasn't real good construction. So the deluxe suite, they all had mirrors on the ceiling, the sticky tiles. So they're always falling off on people's heads. There's, I mean, it was funny. There's cords draped across because they didn't put enough outlets in. So there's this giant orange extension cord stretched across the hotel room so the coffee maker could be. It was funny. Right? So you got a deluxe suite. You, I'm getting to the irresistible part. You got your meals. You got all the booze you could drink, not just at the tables, but in the bar. If you want to sit in the bar and listen to the music, all the booze was free. And you got $1,000 of money to gamble with. So for 396 bucks, you got your room for two nights and three days, as they say in the travel business. You got meals, or you got two tickets to a show in the showroom, um, which was, that was a story in and of itself. And on top of everything else, you got $1,000 to gamble with. It's irresistible. The person says, wait a minute. And even when you understand it, it's still pretty irresistible. So $1,000 is all match play, meaning you got a dollar chip of this. You make an even money bet, you win, you get a dollar real chip, but they keep the dollar match play chip. So really, the $1,000 is 500 bucks is really what it is. And you can't cash them, you got to play them. So, but still, Still, five, you got $500, you got your room, you got all the booze you can drink for free, you got your meals, you got a show ticket. Huh, if you believe this is real, that there's actually a place there, when you get there, you say, this is fantastic. Stupak was famous, by the way. He had rigged games. Well, they're all rigged, but he had this MIT whiz guy designed special games. Some were pretty obvious and some weren't, but like you could play dealer face-up blackjack, which everybody thought, huh, how can you lose a dealer face-up blackjack? The odds were actually 30% worse than they were with real blackjack, because they also changed some of the rules. You couldn't double down. and you, you know. So when it was all said and done, even knowing you couldn't win. Right? So what dumb people did, including my brother, <laughs> twice, twice, would go to the roulette, so he's got his thousand dollars of match play, right? I'm going to turn this into cash, so I'm not captive here. I can go gamble anywhere. I'll fix them. And he would go to the roulette wheel and bet half of it on red and half of it on black. 
Lots of people did this. Bob said people did it all the time. Mm -hmm. His roulette wheel had 11 green zeros. <laughs> huh? However, free drinks, free food, the room, you ain't going nowhere anyway, except over to the ATM machine, from which Bob got a 10% commission. So this ad is truly an irresistible offer ad. It makes it brain dead. One part of you is saying, there's a catch. Another part of you is saying, hell, even if there is. All right? Got to do it anyway. Now, here's what's amazing about this, kind of as an aside. So this built this place. If you go look at it now, what's there? It was all built, one floor at a time, with money that came in from these ads. This went on for a decade. Nobody ever copied it. It started everybody thinking he's an idiot, right? You're going to lose your ass. How could you be making any money doing this? Well, first of all, the average redemption was 36 months after purchase. So and we were in days of 18% to 22% interest. So building with this money and not debt, you make money no matter what. But then the game is rigged, of course. Nobody copied it. Debbie Reynolds went, bo went broke with a casino hotel in Vegas, and I knew her son, and I tried to get her to do this. Because it would be even more believable if we got Debbie Reynolds. No, 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 no. So nobody's ever copied it. You see this a lot. That's why you want to look at the gold and the old. This would work perfectly today. And if I was running Caesar's Palace, I'd be running this promotion like there's no tomorrow. But nobody copied it. It's a perfect irresistible offer. A linked school of advertising is called the irresistible bribe. The mistake most people make with bribes, bonuses, premiums, freemiums, is they feel compelled to make them relevant. So like, if you look at all the Joseph A. Bank advertising, when they're not giving away five for one, they're, you buy a suit, you get a sport coat, you get a shirt, you get a tie, right? You never get like tickets to mud wrestling, which would probably be more effective. Right? So there is the issue of relevant or irrelevant but the point of the irresistible bribe is to make you buy something you really don't want because you want the bribe. Anybody know who invented it? You can yell it out if you know. Estee Lauder invented it. It, of course, is the norm in the cosmetic business. Is you come to the cosmetic counter at the department store and you got to buy X amount of glop because you get the bag or you get the hat. Victoria's Secret does it. You got to buy 22 pair of panties and you get the duffel bag, the tote bag. Oh, boy. Estee Lauder invented that. By the way, if you see a guy walking around with a pink and white Victoria Principal tote bag, carrying his stuff in it, you know he bought 22 pair of panties. You don't know anything else yet, but you know that's how he's got that bag. So the irresistible bribe is about the bribe driving the sale. I don't really want this thing, or I don't want it very badly. I'm kind of on the fence about it. But oh, that, that. So the most famous and the most enduring in this category is actually B2B. So one of the things you will hear if you hang around here is you will hear the B2B people bitching. Oh, almost all the stuff they show us is for selling to consumers, and it doesn't work for B2B, yada, yada, yada. 
So, this is the most famous and the most enduring. It's a promotion for Ad Age magazine, which is a trade journal for people in the ad agency world. It's a fairly expensive sub subscription. I forget how much. They have never beaten this control. And they don't like it, so they keep putting it on the shelf and try to beat it, and then they do it again. Okay. The premium is a coffee mug that is a replica of the front page of Ad Age magazine. And it is your name put in there, wins Marketing Genius Award. That's the premium. What, a buck, maybe? A couple bucks? Tops? I think it's a $200, $300 a year subscription. I mean, it ain't cheap. They've never beat this. And you will, uh, me included, so I've subscribed twice. I don't want the magazine. I just wanted the damn cup. All right? You will hear people tell you, I think I've subscribed five damn times. I don't really want the magazine, but I really wanted that cup. There's a speaker. Um, i going to do one more. There's a speaker. His name's Joel Weldon. Anybody know Joel? Yeah, there we go. A couple old farts. Um, so Joel, um, I don't mean any disrespect, but Joel's a personal development kind of success speaker. He's a very good speaker, by the way. His, whole, his shtick is success comes in cans, not in cannots. And he has this little thing. It's like a label for a baby food can. And it's success comes in cans, not in cannots. And the recipe is two tablespoons of positive attitude and one teaspoon. Of, I mean, really? Huh? You got to be hitting me. So we produced Joel's tapes when I was in the cassette production business. Cassettes are a thing. Yeah, well, yeah, you can Wikipedia. It's spelled with a C. Um, um, so we did a mailing, and the premium was you got one of these cans. In fine print, you didn't get the can. You got the damn label. Go buy your own baby food, right? So if you bought all four albums, 50 bucks a piece at the time, so 200 bucks, 1980-something, you got this can. We're flooded with calls. I don't really want the albums. Can I buy the can? Can I buy 12 cans? Can I buy 144 cans? We want the cans. We want the cans. We want the cans. You can have as many of them as you want at cost, but you've got to buy the four albums. Okay, I'll buy the four albums. This is a business work. That's how you know you got a great premium. I saved the Think and Grow Rich TV infomercial by changing the premiums. I didn't change anything else. I just changed the premiums. So an irresistible bribe. So if you happen to be selling something that, generally speaking, people don't want, and you can't fix it, you can fix the bribe. Direct sales industry figured this out many moons ago. How do you sell something nobody wants, like fire alarms in the home? Who the hell wants fire alarms? Nobody. Especially not at like 4,000 bucks free smoke detector. Well, you give them a trip to Vegas and cutlery and crystal wear. All right, I'll take the damn fire alarms. Well, that's the business they were in. Brings us to the last one of this morning. We have two more sessions, by the way. I will be better equipped for the second one. Flashlight, sheet, we'll be good to go. So, gift with appointment. Last one. So many of you are in some kind of business where you want to get somebody to a showroom, you want to get them into a doctor's office, you want to get them into a financial advisor's office, you want to get them on to a phone call, because a phone call is an appointment. You want to get them onto a webcast. A webcast is an appointment. So gift with appointment is a time-honored, classic, 
If you go back into old advertising, but I'm going to show you current examples, you will find gift with appointment used. All this is doing is bribing somebody for permission to present. In the fire alarm business, the way you got the rep in the house was with the big stuffed Dalmatian dog. Knock on door, kick door open wide, kids see dog. No, you can't come in. Kids, should come in, bring the dog, gift with appointment. So, I'm going to show you two examples. And one of these you're going to be able to get your little paws on. Um, oh, I have one more thing. I've got to speed up a little bit. So this is gift with appointment for Miracle Air. This is a piece of the shock and awe package that would get sent to a customer after they booked an appointment to make sure they showed up. This is all free gifts. I'll just be quick. So here's relevant. When you come to the appointment, you get five fascinating health secrets special reports, none of which have to do with hearing. They have to do with everything else old people uh, deal with with health. Then there's the irrelevant gifts. TV trivia book, old classic TV or movie DVD, and a magnifying glass. Because what old person who can't hear can see? They all kind of go blind and deaf at the same period of time. You know? Charlie Jarvis's joke to me was, you, you can look forward to this. At some point, your dog will do double duty. He can lead you around and chew your food for you. I said, that's terrific, Charlie. So all these gifts were when you came to the appointment. By the way, as a side effect, in 1,200 offices, they immediately made all the salespeople honest. Because before that, they were all claiming like an 80% close rate. But when they had to requisition gifts for every appointment, everybody suddenly knew exactly how many presentations that they were making, and they weren't closing 80%. So sometimes this has other benefits. But, so this is classic free gift with the appointment. I have a client right now who sells by classic diagnostic call, get them on the phone, do a presentation, they're hooked up to the computer at the same time, they're looking at PowerPoints, etc. We ran a test two months ago. It's about to become the control. You're qualified, you come to that call, you complete that 90 minute call, whether you do anything or not, we give you $500. Guy, I don't care, the guy's making a half a million dollars. It's hard to walk away from 500 bucks if he was on the fence anyway. The math works for us. This is, and you're right in the front row, because if you were in any other row, you couldn't see anything. This, 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 this is Partiv Shaw's version, B to B. This is e-launchers. You'll find them in the exhibit hall. It's a little annoying Indian guy. Not, yeah, there you go. Doesn't matter. Stand up, sit down, don't make any efforts. Nobody can see you. Right? We could have her take a picture of you and put it up on the screen, but she's clearly busy doing something. I don't know what she's watching that's so fascinating down there on the floor, but God bless her. Uh, but, but, but that's the only way anybody could see you. But they can find your booth at Sea Launchers. Um, um, so this is free gifts. Now, this is consumer. This is old people for hearing aids. If you closely compare this, you will find in a B2B environment, he's doing the same thing, and it's gift with appointment. You bought a bunch, right? If you want a copy of his version, go to the booth. He'll be happy to give it to you. Last thing, gift on arrival. I'll tell you this quick just because it's so cool. Back to Bob Stupak. So Bob sold that package largely by direct mail. So he needed a list. What better list than the friends, neighbors, or relatives of the people who were there drinking it up, whooping it up, having a good time? 
So one of the gifts you got on arrival was postcards. Because what do people do? What did they used to do? They still do. Buy postcards, send postcards home. So he gave you postcards with this little toilet paper slip, toilet paper seat strip wrapped around them. We pay postage for these Vegas World postcards. Just put them in the special mailbox located at the vacation club counter on the main floor. Five to everybody. 300 rooms times five is 1,500 postcards. I said to Bob, how many don't use them? He said, nobody. They all use them. Every single one of them. 100% redemption. Irresistible offer, free postage. We got to know somebody we can send it to. My brother even sent him. I didn't know he had five friends. Sent him out. What'd they do? Entered all the names and addresses in the database before they mailed the postcard. Everybody a week later started getting direct mail. You should come to Vegas World, buy this package. You might not have known, but your cheap ass friends were here on this whiz bang deal. Gift on arrival.